Joan Agajanian Quinn is the former West Coast editor of Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine and society editor of the Herald Examiner. Her cover stories are seen in Venice and Detour magazines, and she is a contributing editor to Angelus Magazine. For the next half hour, Joan will bring you inside news and views on society, art, film, and the exhilarating worlds of these multifaceted people. Here is Joan Quinn. With us today on Etc. are two gorgeous women from England. Marina Citrus. Sirtis. <laughs> I always say it wrong. <laughs> Marina Sirtis and Elizabeth Gage. But before we go on and talk to Marina, who's right here keeping track of everything I do, <laughs> let's watch the click page because I covered a party at Joanne Carson's house and she always has a star-studded affair. It was for Bobby Morris and I covered it for Angelus Magazine. Watch the screen. <laughs> I knew I was going to do that. Certus. There's Bobby coming into the party with Joanne. He was very surprised he had just finished uh, Is True. It after the show? Yes, after the show. He finished True. He was portraying writer Truman Capote. He um, worked on Broadway, worked in San Francisco, worked in Los Angeles. Betty White's always up there. Kevin Conway is playing the lead in Other People's Money. Okay. He came after his uh, show. And Bobby Blake, Robert Blake and Rosemary Clooney, he said that this was the first time he'd been photographed for five years. <laughs> he wanted the new paparazzi after him. Not the first time Susan Anton's been photographed no. in five years. No. She, that's Michael Jackson, who's the Michael Jackson on the radio talk show with Alana, who was Alan Ladd's daughter, and Lynn Redgrave with her husband. I don't know them. <laughs> I feel I should know every English person in LA, but I don't. I think you should too. Bobby Morris and his very pregnant wife. Two people who were the same size, <laughs> Pia and Sally. <laughs> they just matched up perfectly. And the great thing was, Bob Hope came out to the party and stayed all night. He was there till about one in the morning. It was amazing because how many times do you get to go to a party and have Bob Hope sitting around? It's just uh, great. Personally, never. I mean, really, yeah. it was very impressive. Mel Torme had just sung at a John Wayne Cancer Society uh, party the night before. So there's Bob with Phyllis Diller. So, here we are. I was the only person in Hollywood not at that party, obviously. <laughs> we'll make sure you're there next time. Actress Marina Sirtis was trained in England. She became known, really, in the United States for her role as the spaceship counselor on Star Trek, the next generation. Now, what in the world would a spaceship counselor do? Well, basically, counselor is like, a, is like um, the formal, my formal, formal title for being the ship's psychologist and advisor um. to the captain. Um, basically, Gene Roddenberry, who created Star Trek, um, he has a vision that on our enterprise, which is on a 15-year mission, um, the quality of life will be better. So um, the chief engineer keeps the mechanical cogs turning, and I keep the mental cogs turning. And so if anyone has a problem, they can come to my office and we'll talk about it. Did you have to take psychic training or any kind of special training before you got this role? Um, well, without giving it too much of a plug, all I did actually was enrolled. Um, I subscribed to Psychology Today for a year. Did you? <laughs> Did that you? was my research. And um, basically, I got the part because they said, well, the director said, that he sensed I had an empathy in, in myself. And you're empathic. And I'm empathic on the show, and so that was why they cast me, I think. When you go out to parties, do people expect you to be reading their minds? Well, they do. People get confused <laughs> about the character and the, and the actress, and I try and put them straight. Um, <laughs> we're two totally different people. and. Uh, you know, guys, it's usually a guy line, you know, read my what mind. am I thinking, you know, and it's like, oh, please, this is the tenth time today, you know, so don't please say it to me if you ever run into me, it's really boring. Well, well they, they, they walk, they come into your um, chamber 
to find out what's going on. And everyone asked me when I said that I was having uh, the spaceship counselor on today, is there sex? On the spaceship. Well, um, I know it's tacky to ask. But well, yes, th there is, and we saw it. I mean, we didn't see it. We we saw it implied <laughs> last season, um, and of course, it was my character um, in bed with a fellow alien. And um, basically, all it was was <clears throat> he was rubbing oil into my feet. We were in bed. That was mm. the first for oh, Star the, Trek. You I see. see. Um, he was rubbing oil onto my feet and I rubbed oil onto his chest and then we laid down together and it was cut. That was it. Um, That's but outer of, space. Uh, but of course, I don't know what the Trekkers think, you know, because we did get a lot of complaints that, that, you know, sex on the Enterprise was not allowed. Well, tell us when you do see the Trekkies, because you go to a lot of conventions. A lot. <laughs> Where are they? What do they do? Everywhere. Tell They're everywhere. Uh, I'm, last weekend I was in North and South Carolina. This weekend I'm going to be in Texas. Um, Is that part of the job? No, it's purely um, voluntary. Really? You, you just do it if you want to do it. And I really enjoy doing it because I've come from the theatre in England and it's, it's my chance to get up in front of a live audience and have that feedback. And I find out a lot from the fans about what they like, what they don't like, you know, which direction they'd like to see the show go in. But what do you do? Do they have the audience? They yeah. have an audience and, and you're on stage? And you do a question and answer session, oh, you basically. Do. Oh. and try and make it as amusing as possible, which is what I try to do. And um, they go away. Actually, what happens a lot is that people come up to me and say, you know, we think Troy is really dull, but we love you. So, oh. <laughs> you know, so they, if, even if they're not my character's fans, they become my fans. So it's good for, my, for me as an actress. What too. do they look for? They, they also have booths, I understand. Do they, they have, have dealer's booths where they can buy, you can buy all sorts of, you know, space age paraphernalia or science fiction stuff. Um, <clears throat> They have slideshows, they have fancy dress costumes or costume contests. Do they have costumes that are like the, your costumes from the show? And they make them and they come dressed I mean they, as you, you know, it's bizarre. Is that right? Yeah, but it's wonderful. I mean, the, the only time I've been a bit worried was when a guy was dressed up as Councillor Troy. He, did he wear a wig? Yeah. He did? He did. He was wearing a dress and a wig, and I thought that was a bit worrying. But <laughs> apart from that, they're usually pretty, you know, harmless. What is uh, a Trekkie collectible? I know we were talking the other day, and you said that somebody came to you with... Yeah, um, books. books. Well, um, they're not collectible so much. Anything that they can steal from the set, obviously, is <laughs> worth vast amounts of money. But I was at a convention, and somebody came up to me with 20 paperback books and uh, asked me to sign them. And uh, I said, OK. So I signed these 20 books and said, what are you going to do with all these books? And he said, well, this is my kids' college fund. So people are really putting it, looking at it as an investment. investment. <laughs> yeah, and he will sell them in years to come and, and make some money. And you, are you keeping your costumes? I'm keeping my scripts. <laughs> oh, that's good. But I have to start writing some rude words in them, because they're, apparently they're worth more when you kind of deface them. <laughs> but I, never, I keep my scripts perfect, because it doesn't take me long to learn my lines. And so they're all pristine and new. And they said, oh, no, no, you've got to write stuff on, you know, like, <laughs> Patrick's horrible today, you know, or something, <laughs> to make them worth some money. Yeah, well, that'll be your insurance, right? Tell us about your heritage. Greek. Greek. Well, it's gr in, in America, were born, it's Greek. No. Were you born in um, Greece or no. were you born in London? I was born in London, and when I was in England, I regarded myself as English. Um, in America, you have to be something else. You can't, it's, you're from where your parents came from or where your family came from. So in America, I'm regarded as Greek, even though I sound like an English person. But, right. but I would say I'm English because I was born and brought up there. Right. Well, what we're going to see is a movie that you made for the BBC. And it's a, a movie where you played a Greek girl. Actually, this could have been me if I'd made some different choices in my life, and I don't just mean the hairdo. Do you? Let's <laughs> yes. see what, let's uh, see that on, on our screen. <laughs> you want money? Here, Harry, so I hear your daughter's dowry was 20,000. My God, that ugly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you see, he's a big jug, eh? <laughs> Wait till he get the daughter. Oh, this is England, gentlemen. The girls go their own way. In this country, they marry for love. All women, they marry for love. Money is just custom. Uh, it's easy for Petro. He don't have this problem. Is there anybody in there? Yeah, you should be so lucky, Jimmy, to have a daughter like this beautiful you, Maria. You, my Maria, <laughs> I touch wood. Oh, she's beautiful. Educated, dignified, 
and the single. Eh? <laughs> customers might be a pain, but there is no need to poison them. I must say this, Petro. Maria is a good daughter. She look after her father, and she runs the business. Uh -uh. She make the business. backgammon and lively intellectual conversation a civilized way to grow old <laughs> one must grow up before one grows old mr summer <laughs> some people grow old too soon miss maria yeah. well better early than never very good i'm still a mug for six form humor i don't recall you having made the six form mr Sava. <laughs> Oh, Dad, I'm going to go and check on the builders, otherwise we can plan a new opening date. I'll be back around four. Okay. A bit shrewd. Were there things in that that you could feel in your own life? Uh, yes. I mean, she was Greek, and she was, she, she, but she, unlike me, she took the Greek way. I mean, she, she basically didn't marry until late in life, which she's supposed to be about 35 there. Um, but because Greek girls are supposed to marry young, but she had stayed to look after her widowed father, stayed with him, and then she kind of falls for this bad guy. Um, and then, but what about your life? Did you marry young? No, I didn't, <laughs> but they tried to make me. Um, my, <laughs> my parents, when I was 19, tried to arrange a marriage for me, which is still done in Greek circles, especially in some Greek villages, not so much in the cities now in Greece and Cyprus. But um, they tried, and I embarrassed them in front of the matchmaker. I was very rude to her. And so they never tried it again because the worst thing you can do, you know, is embarrass your parents. And so, and so basically they left me alone after that. And then, but how was it that you could go into acting then? Was that was kind of against a Greek tradition It was too. a battle. It was a total battle. I mean, my mother kept thinking I was going to grow out of this phase and I never did. And it, in fact, I have to say it wasn't until I got Star Trek that I actually have almost got approval. Is Not that about three years? You've been there three years now. Four. Four years. Yeah, it's basically. And it's an Emmy, a winning, uh, Emmy award winning show. Yeah, and uh, it's basically to do with earning money, though. And finally, I'm earning some money. But aren't so, they worried that you're not married? Or are you married? No, I'm not know. married. I'm not married. Um, <laughs> my mum used to put down certain rules about who I could and could not marry. But now she just says, I don't care who it is. Just get married. Have some kids. You know, <laughs> I don't care. No rules. Just get married. So I do have a boyfriend. And we possibly will get married quite soon. Really? Oh, yeah. yeah. Where do you live? I live up in Beechwood Canyon. Oh, great. And is he in the business? He's a musician. Oh, wonderful. Well, what do you do in your spare time? I know you do some really American things. Like what? I don't you have a motorcycle. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> we did have a motorcycle, but um, my boyfriend had a terrible accident on it in November and has, some, has a oh. very badly broken leg still. Oh, dear. And so um, we don't ride the motorcycle anymore. But we did. We were a very hot couple on the motorcycle, <laughs> I have to say. Um, but I'm addicted at the moment to another very American thing, which is Game Boy. Oh, you were talking about that. Tetris. I'm a Tetris fanatic, and I play that. And the only thing that got me away from that is that my boyfriend recently bought me a puppy. So in between Tetris and the puppy, I have no spare time now. Well, now you're going to have to w stay on the set with us right now, because Elizabeth Gage, the internationally known jewelry designer, will be with us. And will you stay on and talk with her? I will, because she's lovely. Thank you. We'll be back. Welcome back. We have with us Elizabeth Gage, the internationally known jewelry designer. And Elizabeth's work takes on an antique, very kind of ancient look. But she's making that work, doing that work today, and we want to know how she does it. How do you do it, Elizabeth? Well, I really don't know um, how to describe how I do it, except that I've studied jewelry in Egypt and in Greece, and then right through the medieval and renaissance. And somehow it's become part of me, so it just flows out now. Have you always been a jewelry designer? No, I haven't. I was doing research when I stumbled upon uh, ring making. And I went and trained as a goldsmith for six years. What kind of research? I was doing research on a man who lived in France in the 18th century. Oh, you, were you writing? Uh, I was planning to write. But then I reached a complete impasse um, because I could not 
establish the date that he was born on, nor the date that he <laughs> died, because he was a mystic. Oh, and he was one yeah. of those very elusive men, and he was called the Comte de Saint-Germain. Oh, that's very interesting. We have uh, the, the psychic here. I don't know when he was born or died either. <laughs> you can't tell us. You can't <laughs> fill it in. <laughs> so you just quite by chance. Quite by chance. But I understand you went to art school. I went to art school first of all, and then because I've always been good at making things with my hands, I went to this college in London and trained as a goldsmith. And people saw what I was making, and then they would say, well, please, will you make me something? And gradually, bit by bit, it grew and grew. And then it became larger than I could cope with, unless I wanted to sort of eat and not sleep. So I found other people who could make for me. Were you working for yourself then oh, as yes. a goldsmith? Oh, yes. Always worked for myself. Have you ever... I I know you did do some work at one time for Cartier. You did a special collection. I did a special collection for them in New York. One thing that I know stands out in Elizabeth Gage jewelry are the stones. You use a lot of colored stones. Yes, I do. I love color. I'm very much a color lady. Yeah, you look great. Lots <laughs> and of um, I find stones all over the world. and. Uh, I'm known for using unusual stones, but really, to me, they're not unusual. It's just that I've found them like tourmalines. Um, the public don't know what marvelous colors there are in tourmalines. What colors are there? Oh, wonderful blues and greens and reds and pinks and extraordinary colors. You know, people always think of tourmaline as being green. They don't yeah. realize there's a range, a wide range. And the range. blues are extraordinary, I, too. I don't think I know the blues. Oh, wonderful. When you this is a terrible thing to say about jewelry and precious stones, but mixing and matching colors. Mm -hmm. Do you feel comfortable doing that? And can your clients relate to uh, Oh, very all much that? so. And I think that that's why they come to me, because I use my colors like an artist maybe uses his, his colors. And I love to find the balance and sometimes to, to shock with the color. But let's, let's shocking color today. You're wearing a pink suit with a beautiful turquoise necklace yes. and an old uh, coin in the middle. Can, can you get a little close up on that because it just looks so wonderful and tell us what the inspiration is for that necklace. Well the inspiration for the necklace came, I first of all found the turquoise and uh, I've always loved coins because they're a decoration and the coin that I have here was actually found in England, and it was found just near where I have a house. Oh. Uh, long before I found the house, uh, there was a great treasure trove that was found down by the river. And uh, they dug this coin out, and it was part of the Midden Hall tr treasure trove. Just quite by chance. Just quite by chance. I think it's all very these things happen. Mystical. <laughs> I think it's very mystical. <laughs> Is there a trend now in jewelry making or jewelry buying? Um, I don't know. I think that's very hard for me to say because I've always stayed away from trends. Um, I like to do different things and always keep changes happening. So I'm not one to go for trends, really. One thing that. I know you're very well known for is your enamel work. I think yes. enamel is very difficult from what I understand. Tell us what the process is and why it's so difficult. Well, it's, you have to grind glass very, very finely. And it's a process of putting on this ground glass and then firing it and then rubbing it down with pumice and then uh, putting more glass on and you repeat the process two or three times. And what happens in the, along the way? It becomes molten glass if you haven't also uh, melted the piece that you've been doing, which um, can happen. So you can have um, damage occur. And you mm. have, so it's very fine work. Tell, tell us about this one piece in the center. We had a close-up. Well, that was a piece that I sculpted. And uh, to give it a little bit more Bazaars, I uh, enameled all around a molten um, gold setting with a South Sea pearl in the middle. Is it a pin? A it's brooch? a pin. It's a pin. And these are rings? And those are rings. Those are my Templar rings. And that is a, a double stone lapis oh, ring. Oh, beautiful. beautiful, isn't it? Beautiful. With enameling. 
I know you were awarded one of the highest accolades in British uh, industry, the Queen's Award. Really? Well, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Last year. Thank you. <laughs> but what I really want to know is, does she just design for the Queen with that award? <laughs> no, we were all very happy with that award because it's something that is given to a company that has shown outstanding um, efforts in exports and we really had just by by chance and everybody was thrilled. Was you don't just nice. design for the Queen with that? I don't just design for the Queen. Do you design for any of the royals? Uh, I never talk about my customers or who I design for because that's something that's they appreciate in me that I'm very um, quiet about that. I never talk about oh. it. Can we so draw? I can't I can't tell any secrets. Can we draw on you, Marina? To talk about the royals? I've never met a royal in my life. Oh, to no, talk you're about empathic to find out oh, who her. Um, <laughs> oh, she's dear. blocking me. She's blocking she's me. Blo it's not the queen. <laughs> Maybe it's the queen. But you come from a, a background of uh, royal heritage, too. Tell us a little bit about it. I think it's interesting, all the way back to 1700s in Massachusetts, part of your family. That's right. That's right. My, my ancestor was a General Gage of Bunker Hill um, fame, and he carried off an American lady and made her his bride. And she's now in the San Diego Art Museum, uh, painted by Copley. Oh. And then I, before him, I had um, an ancestor who was controller at the Tower of London. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> With first under Queen Mary and then under Elizabeth. So it was pretty good that he got them both because there was quite a bit of difficulty between them. To say the least. <laughs> and then how does it go on? How does the rest of the family come into it? Oh gosh, that's a long story. I don't know. We've, we've dwindled down. Do we? <laughs> but <laughs> does that a make a chain. big difference in uh, living in London? Does that open doors for you? I don't think so. No, I've always been very independent. And uh, most people don't know anything about that. Oh, you heard it here first. <laughs> 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 Tell us. I want to just look at one more, one more um, piece of jewelry that I really love because it's two carved birds. Cockatoos. Yes, I found those um, last year, and they are green tourmalines with a citrine um, headdress. They're beautiful and super. And they're touching their noses together which I rather liked. Were they carved, or did you have to have them carved? No, I had them carved specially. Uh, aren't they? Oh, they're, they're wonderful. So yeah, great. They're lovely, very Those luminous. And before we go, what I, this <laughs> is I, probably my most favorite thing. So tell us about this piece, too. Well, that is an agate um, uh, cameo head. And I sculpted the gold around it specially to hold it. And I picked up the um, hair of the lady with chalcedony drops. How do you do? How, how in, do you in do color, that? color wise. And did you have to carve found, this piece out, or was yes, it? Yes. No, I found her, and then I had the pieces of chalcedony cut to to embellish the statement, really, that I was trying to make. Do people bring you? their old jewelry and ask you to make Very things? often, yes. And do you do that? I love it, yes. Oh, that's yes. great. Tell me what, if someone were going into a shop or if Marina were wearing something, a brooch or an earring, how, how, would, we, how would we know <laughs> that it was Elizabeth Gage? What little things could we look for that would tell us Elizabeth Gage? I think that it's, I, I don't know really how to answer that because I think you'd have to ask somebody else. My, my jewelry is a is bold and it's colorful and people say that they can see the handwriting through it but I don't I can't see that I'm too close I, to I it. I went to Elizabeth's show on Monday and it des definitely definitely has a, a signature. It does. it does, it has Especially an Especially the, the rings are you, I mean there's just no doubt that you designed the rings and it's wonderful because it's almost like you know a Van Gogh has certain brush strokes, mm -hmm. you have your brush strokes and mm. it's, it's the same kind of thing. Do you still like to get in at the, on the bench and absolutely. work? Absolutely. You I'm do? Absolutely. I don't get enough time anymore, but I'm very much in there. 
I love it. When you come to uh, America, where do you visit? I visit friends and I have a wonderful time and I'm so impressed with the houses and the gardens here and I've never in all my life, England is supposed to be the place of the rose, but right. I've never seen such roses as I see here. This year. It's fantastic, absolutely I think this fantastic. Year we're very, very lucky. I don't know why, but something my happened. roses are amazing this year too. Something happened to the roses. You can drive all Wonderful. over the city and they're Unbelievable. Great. Unbelievable. Do you garden? I do. I oh, do. So I love you it. can appreciate oh, it. Oh my goodness, yes. We have just a couple of minutes left. What is a favorite part of Los Angeles to you? What do you particularly like? Well, I love it. Um, I love it down by the beach. Uh, I love Malibu Colony and all around there with those marvelous houses and and just driving through. I mean, I don't know the names of all the streets and everything, so I can't tell you. But it's fascinating. And Marina, now that you're an old timer here, now what do I'm you love about Los Angeles? Um, there isn't anything that I don't love about Los Angeles. I have to say that I'm a total Los Angeles file. If, if that's if they, I'm going to make a word up, um, even the tra I mean even to me the traffic. I mean we, we're stuck in traffic a long time, but you're stuck in traffic everywhere in the world now. At least in LA, when you get there, there's going to be someone to park your car. You know, and when you're sitting in your car, at least you're not sitting on a bus with a lot of other people who maybe haven't worn deodorant that day. You know, at least you're sitting in your car, you have your cassette tape, you have your Evian bottle. It's, <laughs> you know, it's kind of civilized. I think LA is one of the most civilized um, cities in the world. I'm sure a lot of people disagree with me, but I really think it is. Well, I love hearing you people talk about Los Angeles <laughs> because I love Los Angeles too, being a native. And I want to thank you both for being with us today. Thank you, Joan. Thank, thank you, you. Joan. Thank you. So you can't get up yet. You have to wait a little.